stick to linear regression? Well, I've been um, actually already preparing you, I hope, for that a little bit. The thing is, as this is the whole heart of the idea of what's going on here, that if I do my experiment another time with 10 persons, I will not get the same slope or the same intercept. There is a statistical, there is a sampling variability. There is a, the, this computation and the, the math way of saying it, these, these slopes and intercepts are also random variables. They take on a new value next time I do it, right? So this is also what happened with my means in the beginning of the course. So I need to deal with this fact. How can I, I cannot just compute the line and, and, and claim that 1.11 is the true relation between weight and height. That's not intelligent. I know that's not for sure the true relation based on my 10 data points. It will be uncertain. I don't know, and I need to deal with that. And the way we deal with it is the usual ways, in a way, when we start learning what inferential statistics is. We're going to do confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, and the basis of that is that we should try to find out either maybe by simulation, we, we'll maybe have a look at that, or let the theory tell us what is the sampling distribution of such a computed intercept, <laughs> the computed intercept and a computed slope, right? How can it be different from time to time? Well, theory can tell us. That's the magic of probability theory. We can find out if we have the skills and you can find it in the notes. But before we look at the mathematical results, let me show you how we could, without the math, and a bit following the simulation idea from last time, but just using it a bit illustrative. <coughs> we could try to do it a thousand times. Let me try to do this uh, one uh, example that I just showed you. Let me do it a thousand times and see what happens. Right? That's what we put into some R stuff here. And let's not dwell on all the R details, but you can say, I put a thousand here on repeats, and then I, I, I do a for loop, so I do all the computations 1,000 times. I compute the intercept and the slope 1,000 times, and then let me look at what happens, right? That's what goes so here, blah, 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 I do the computations. Let me, at the end of it, look at the 1,000 computed slopes and the 1,000 computed intercepts, right? That's what I do at the end here. Let's see if it succeeds. Oh, yeah. There is a distribution of intercept and a distribution of slopes. Beta 1 is the slope, right? The slope seems to go with an average of 200 around, but then plus minus 230 or something like that. I don't know. There is a, there is a variability. There is a sampling variability of the intercept and a sampling variability of the slope. There is an uncertainty about the slope and intercept when I do it many times, right? I can see that. So I just have to get on top of that and then do some interval for the slope, right? A confidence interval based on this insight of what, what could happen. What is the sampling variability? And as I say, we are not going to do it by simulation today. We are going to do it by the classical approach. The and in the classical approach, it can be expressed by formulas explicitly. What is the sampling variability? It's what is called theorem 5.7. It's even proved in the note. It's not part of syllabus to be able to know this proof, but it's given to you if those of you who are interested in the math, you could uh, dig into it. Don't even think about this one now. It's not really relevant for what we talk about today at all. And actually, I would like to point you towards there is a, an, an expression of the same thing that tells us how can the intercept and the slope, and in a way, let me focus on the slope. The slope is the more interesting, right? We've already seen the intercept sometimes is just some artificial number <laughs> that uh, makes sure the line is at the right position, right? So the intercept itself may sometimes be completely ridiculous to even think about. The slope is the interesting information most often. In some physical models, the intercept could also be relevant. 
but most often in statistics, the intercept is irrelevant, the slope is the interesting thing. The variability of the slopes depends on the variability of the x's and this uh, residual variability, how far away from the line are the points on average. The 573 formula, I give it here on the next slide. This is the direct plug-in version of the same thing. So basically I say this is the same as theorem, what was the, yeah, basically the same as the theorem 5.7 results, just expressed slightly differently. It's the same thing. First of all, we have taken the square root to express it as standard deviations, not as variances. Secondly, we have plugged in the sigma hats such that this is, these are formulas that we can explicitly compute, right? And then we use the names that are more relevant, the sigma hat of beta zero and the sigma hat of beta one. Also in R, known as standard errors. That's the name. There were two standard errors in the R output, one with the slope, one with the intercept. These are the ones that R is giving to us. This is the uncertainty, the sampling standard deviation of the slope and the sampling standard deviation of the intercept. Well, yeah, that's how it is. Um, it can be proved, we don't do it. Um, ah, second thing of the theorem. The theorem also tells us that we should compute the way we compute this number that we actually have minimized, so it comes out as small as at all possible. But the way we compute an estimate of this underlying variance is by taking the sum of all the squared residuals, not dividing by n, not dividing by n minus one, but dividing by n minus two. It is linked with the fact that now we don't compute one mean, we compute two pieces of information, the intercept and the slope, to get at the mean of our data. And that is why it's not a mathematical proof, but <laughs> it is the mathematical proof comes, will depend on this, will come from this fact that now I use two pieces of information for the mean, which means I only have n minus two pieces of independent information for the variance. So the right and unbiased way to compute the variance would be to divide by n minus two and not n minus one. This is it. Great, 15 minutes, there you go. 